Aloha, my name is Don Yabusaki and I'm a member of the AARP Hawaii Executive Council. On behalf of AARP Hawaii and our speakers, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, What to Do If You Live in a High Rise. This session is the last of four weekly webinars that we've been holding each Saturday in June to help you plan for hurricanes. Before we start, let's do a quick bit of housekeeping. This is a picture of what you should be seeing at the bottom of your Zoom screen on a PC and possibly the top of the screen on an iPad. Everyone is currently on mute. If you want to submit a question or comment, please click on the button that says Q&A and type your question. I will be monitoring the questions to make sure that they get answered as they are asked. If you are watching on Facebook Live, you may type your questions in the comments. We are not using the raise hand button for this session. The chat feature can be used if you wanna make a comment to everyone or to communicate a technical question to our volunteers. We recommend that you select side-by-side -side speaker view rather than the gallery view for this presentation. Do this by clicking on the upper right part of your screen. Once you're in that view, you can change the size of the slides or of the speaker simply by clicking and dragging on the middle bar. Finally, we have added closed captioning to this presentation for those who have difficulty hearing. You can turn this off on your end by clicking on the CC Live Transcript button in the lower right of your screen and clicking on hide subtitle. For those of you who are not familiar with AARP, we are a nonprofit social mission organization with a membership of 140,000 people in Hawaii. We want to empower people to choose how they choose to live as they age. Because we live on an island, in an island state, part of that means helping people plan ahead so that they can protect their homes, their families, and themselves in the event of a natural hazard like a hurricane. Hurricanes, thank goodness, don't happen every day or every year, but they have happened, sometimes leaving total devastation in their wake, like with Hurricane Iniki. Our ability to be resilient as a community and even our very lives may depend on our ability to plan for the worst so that we can come out on the other side. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Today's speaker is John Cummings, Public Information and Education Officer for the Department of Emergency Management, City and County of Honolulu. So John, I'd like you to go ahead and uh, please start your presentation. Good morning all. And first off, I wanna thank um, Jerry, Don, uh, Charlene, and everyone here at uh, ARP for inviting me to talk about uh, preparedness issues, especially for our apartment high rise owners here. We have, you know, living here in Hawaii and Honolulu, we have a number of folks that are living in condominiums and apartments. And uh, they have the unique challenges also, right? So what I want to start with first, I want to make this uh, slide share going here. What I'd like to do first is talk a little bit about some of the things, well, why we have to be prepared here. Okay, all right, so why do we need to be prepared? I, I think first off, I think we are you know, living here in Hawaii, I think we're all cognizant of the fact that we are extremely isolated here. Now, no one has more water between point A and point B than we do here in Hawaii. You know, it's, you know, it's great. You know, it's, it's a beautiful place to raise our families. I'll, I'll always live here. But when we talk about things like hurricanes and tsunamis, our isolation combined with our extremely large residential population um, causes us some challenges. You know, any one time when we you know, are on our island here, and we're not the biggest island in the state, we're about the third largest in the counties, right? We have almost a million people on this island. Uh, and so we have challenges, you know, here in Hawaii, uh, we are, and I say sadly, dependent on things from outside of the state to support us in our daily needs. I mean, 
look around your, your home or your office or apartment where you are right now. Uh, the things there, the clothes I'm wearing, those things uh, we have right with it now came from someplace other than Hawaii. So we are dependent on a, a continuous chain of supplies coming in by boat or by aircraft on a daily basis. Um, we talk about our food supply. Uh, our market food supply is replenished once every you know, five to eight days. And again, that's by cargo or by aircraft, right? Um, when we get impacted by a major disaster, we lose that ability to get stuff. And then we're reliant on what we have either prepared for or stored on hand to get us through that disaster time itself. Uh, we know that if the harbor and the airport gets hit really badly, you now we're looking at about um, uh, two weeks before we get those port operations in the har airport um, back open again. That's a long time. So again, it really behooves all of us to understand um, the issues we have when we talk about supply chain and how that needs to impact our preparedness and planning. We gotta be prepared to be on our own. And this is just a bit of a snapshot um, about a week ago of a lot of the cargo traffic that's not only transiting to and from Hawaii, uh, but also into Ireland. So Oahu is not only uh, a hub for us, it's also a hub for all the cargo going to the neighbor islands too. So if we lose our port harbor um, and our airport, everybody in the state's gonna be impacted and affected. And this is just a snapshot of looking at our air traffic on a daily basis. Now, air traffic uh, accounts for about 1% of cargo, but it's still a lot of stuff coming in by air. So again, be aware that if we have a big, uh, we have a large hurricane or tsunami event, we're gonna lose our ability to get stuff from off island. Now we talk about isolation as a state, we can be isolated on our own island. You know, if we get a hurricane or tsunami, we're gonna lose our coastal roads, we're gonna lose our access to other parts of the island. So you could be isolated within your own area for a number of days. So again, we have to look at being prepared for at least two weeks. We have challenges when we talk about evacuations. You know, unlike the continental United States, you can drive away from the hurricane threat. We can't do that here. The farthest inland you can drive anywhere in the state is 60 miles. That'll take you from Hilo to Boacolo, and that's it. So, you know, we have a hurricane coming. Uh, unless you have a one-way ticket off the island, you're here with everybody else. We have to ride these things out and be prepared for that. And our shelters. Currently, our hurricane refuge areas, we have 38 on the island. And that's primarily our, uh, our DOE schools. Uh, we have barely enough shelter space for about 10% of our population, or around 100,000 people. Uh, we've, we've always been challenged for shelters because we just do not have enough uh, robust public buildings that we can access. So we need to plan for this also. So let's talk about hurricane preparedness. Um, first off, for whether you're a homeowner, whether you're an apartment owner, or condo owner, we need to um, understand what our risks are, right? Do you live in a flood zone near a ridge line? Uh, if you're in a home, when was it built? Has it been retrofitted? Um, these are all factors you need to consider. We talk about the impacts of a hurricane type event, right? Uh, and then once we understand these hazards and how they can affect us, look at building your family disaster plan, uh, having a disaster spike in 14 days, uh, consider hardening your home or your apartment. There's some things you can do, check insurance, and decide now, based on your plan, whether or not you can shelter in place at home or if you will have to evacuate. So we've, this has probably been covered pretty well in the last three uh, sessions. Uh, but again, a hurricane, when we talk about hurricanes, the threats, of course, are high winds, storm surge, and heavy rains. Um, by themselves, it's not that bad, but a hurricane brings all these at one time. So we have extremely high winds, we have devastating storm surge and heavy rains. And in a hurricane, the killer, a lot of folks think the killer is the winds. It's not, it's the storm surge. Folks who live on the shoreline or do not evacuate in time are quickly overcome by the, the waves and drown. So storm surge really is a killer when we talk about hurricane events. So let's talk about a high rise, some of our hazards and some of our preparedness issues that are unique to uh, folks living in apartment buildings. Now, uh, building owners and tenants should plan and prepare for the triple threat, as, triple threat, as I mentioned, high winds, storm surge, and flooding rain, because uh, it can affect a condominium and a high rise just as much as it can affect a residential home. Uh, hurricane storm surge waves and heavy rains can cause inundation and flooding. Uh, this can impact the building uh, and basin, especially lower parking lot areas. Um, majority of our buildings, whether they're residential or commercial buildings, in the basement, 
you're going to find if they have a generator, that's where the generator is. So more than likely, if there's a lot of flooding, if the pumps cannot keep ahead of it, you're going to lose the generation capability for that building itself. And that's going to impact things like elevators. We're going to talk about that. Uh, heavy rainfall can also cause water infiltration from the top of the building down. It'll get into like the top of the elevator shafts, uh, other areas on the roof. If the roof has not uh, uh, been properly uh, set up to handle a lot of water, uh, it can flood and that uh, flooding water will go into apartments. And as with home, hurricane winds can cause damage to weaker structures with roofs being especially vulnerable. Uh, most condominiums and new uh, construction uh, tall buildings high rises are built of a concrete steel reinforced construction, right? So that's pretty good. Uh, and in general, a condo is, is a very robust building. Now, some condominiums, depending, um, the structure itself is concrete and steel reinforced, but the outside facing like where the, where the windows and walls are, sometimes that is just the wall construction. Uh, so you need to understand what, how your uh, condominium, how your apartment building is built. If it's all concrete and steel, you're pretty good structurally, okay? John, I have uh, a, uh, a yes. question that uh, since you just started on the high rises, question is, is it true that hurricane damage to windows most likely occurs at 10 floors and below due to flying debris? So living above the 10th floor is relatively safe from window damage by strong winds? In other oh, words, good. living above the 10th floor is highly unlikely that the windows will be blown in by hurricane winds. Is that true? That's actually a good question. That's not, that's going to be, that's coming up on my next slide. So we'll cover, we'll cover the last vulnerability. All right. But hold that thought. Okay. So um, I think we all know that, you know, following a major hurricane or tsunami, our electrical grid is going to be impacted because all of our power generation capability is actually exists within the shorelines because they need water for cooling, right? So if we lose electrical power, uh, no AC power, more than likely you're going to have no or limited access to elevators. Uh, most buildings, the generator, if there is one, will power like emergency lighting within the building and maybe one elevator. So you need to talk to your building owner management to find out what the status is of elevator power. So if, you're, if the elevators are powered or one powered, you're not bad. But if you have, if your building is going to have no uh, ability to power an elevator uh, post disaster, post hurricane, um, you may want to consider either moving to a lower floor level if it's possible so you can walk in walk up and down, or if you have mobility issues or challenges, you might want to consider evacuating your apartment and, and moving to that of a friend or family member, someplace where you don't have to deal with the elevators and um, the stairwells and access. Uh, we've seen uh, just recently a couple of apartment buildings where their elevators went down for months and residents had to walk them down 20 plus floors, that's a lot. So again, find out if your building uh, um, elevators are powered by a generator. If not, plan for that as part of your disaster planning. So going into the next question with last. Okay, so with any home or condominium, the goal is to have a resistant envelope so that the wind or water cannot enter the building during a hurricane. Now for high rise apartments, um, a standard that I got from Dennis is that windows on floors 60 feet or higher in general, no protection is really needed because windborne degrees, debris are generally located to the lower floor ground levels. I uh, mean, a hurricane is strong, but it can only lift things so high. Now, the caveat to that is that if you're on a higher floor, uh, you're probably safe with the glass as is. But if there's a rooftop of a building next to you, you could be impacted by debris coming off of that building. So it just kind of depends. But in general, uh, hurricane windborne damage is limited to the lower floors under 60 feet, and particularly at 30 feet. Now, most new constructed buildings, the glass is double pane laminate, right? So that's pretty good. You need to understand what that's constructed. So if you're not sure how your building windows are built, uh, talk to your building management or the person you're renting the apartment from to find out exactly what the windows are made from. But again, yes, as, as was stated, usually the impact for a building is on the lower floors uh, up to about 60 feet. Right. Now, there are some things you can do as of homeowners. You can get a uh, roll down uh, window shutters, as you can see here in the picture. Um, they're, not in, they're not expensive, but it's an option. You can also look at getting um, uh, impact resistant glass film, similar to the type that they use on uh, uh, stores to keep their windows up from being broken by things like rocks and that, that will provide you some additional protection. Uh, again, but if, you're, if you cannot protect your windows, you can still shelter in place uh, in an interior room. We'll get to that in the next slide. 
So again, uh, yes, usually the uh, impact from a hurricane debris is limited to the lower floors, under 60 feet and under 30 feet. Um, an additional question has yes. been asked. Um, in a high rise, should you leave the windows open a crack so that the hurricane winds don't hit you full force? Or should you close the windows tight? Close, close, close. Homes, condos, close, close, close. Now, if you have louvers, it's awful hard because louvers, we love louvers here in Hawaii because they allow the trade winds to come in. But when you close them, the wind and the rain and wind can still come in through the gaps. Uh, so louvers are hard to, hard to deal with. But the bottom line is, you need to, as much as possible, seal up the entire home or apartment. Because once the wind gets inside, uh, that starts a process of, well, in a home, it can lift the roof off. Uh, if the wind gets inside the apartment, it's going to cause more damage and allow the rain to get in. So you've got to button everything up as much as possible. Seal, 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 close, 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 bottom line. Okay. So let's talk about sheltering in place in a high rise. Uh, we talk about this for homes, uh, but it's the same process. Now, if you can shelter in place in your condominium or apartment, that's really the best option because again, we, we don't have enough shelters. And if you have to go to one of our hurricane refuge areas, you have to take all of your supplies with you. And that's a lot to do, right? So in an apartment building, again, you know, making sure that uh, your apartment is, 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 is well built, um, hopefully concrete and steel reinforced building, 10 stories or higher, um, ideally outside of the storm surge hazard area, but if you, need, if you are in a storm surge hazard area on the shoreline where a lot of our condos are, you can still shelter in place on the fourth floor or higher. But on the lower floor, you gotta get higher because the storm surge can cause a lot of damage um, even in a condominium. So basically what you wanna do is find an interior room or a closed hallway or stairwell uh, that has no exterior windows. Uh, and this is where you will shelter in place. So it could be like an interior bedroom, interior bathroom. We have a lot of options here or hallways. Uh, these are options. Again, uh, it's a better situation having to take all your supplies and going to a hurricane refuge area. So right now, when you can, take a look around your apartment, your condo, and, and pre-designate an area where you can shelter in place. And again, if you cannot do this uh, at all because of either uh, you're on upper floor, you, uh, mobility issues, and then you might want to plan on evacuating to a friend or family member's house uh, if you do not have the option to shelter in place in your condo apartment. Now, um, uh, this is the, the 800 pound gorilla in, in, in the room. A lot of people either don't think about it or don't want to plan for uh, things like uh, waste products. Uh, so again, we're talking about post hurricane, post tropical storm, no electricity. We have no electricity. We're going to have a limited ability to pump water. No water, no ability to flush toilets, creating additional hygiene issues. So one of the things we try to promote a lot here is considering a, a very simple thing called a twin bucket system here. And uh, you can go to the uh, QR code there on, on the website right now, uh, click on it. Uh, there's a lot of different versions, but basically it's being able to manage waste solid and liquid waste management. Um, so having, uh, you wanna be able to separate solids and liquids. Uh, you wanna also have the ability to store them safely some places. You don't wanna have them uh, in an area where people are gonna trip over them or break a bag open because that's gonna cause another problem. But uh, all of us, whether you're in a home or apartment building, have to have some type of plan for dealing with uh, uh, hygiene and waste. And also making sure that you have a lot of hand sanitizer available uh, to um, keep everything sanitary and clean. And um, part of the process also is um, using heavy mill, heavy duty construction type uh, trash bags for storage of your liquid and solid waste. Uh, but again, it's something we'll have to think about whether we're in a home or apartment or a condo. Uh, some additional preparedness action for those of us who live in high rises. Uh, building owners should consider conducting structural assessments to be aware of uh, um, if they can do uh, some cost effective measures to make the building more resilient for not only for themselves, but also for the folks who live there, right? Um, you know, looking at the roof, can they do things to seal the roof up to minimize water incursion? Uh, within your own apartment or condo right now, if there's any maintenance issues, um, you need to get on those because you don't want to be trying to deal with that when we have a tropical stormers or a hurricane heading our way, right? Um, you also want to consider working with other apartment or condo owners, building management, and the associations to develop a comprehensive disaster plan if one is not already in place. Um, all of our apartments and buildings have to have a fire plan. That's, that's by law, right? But very few have a plan to deal with disasters 
and, and how they're going to work with uh, folks who live in there. You know, if you live in an apartment or a condominium, you're basically here in a small city, right? You have your, your utilities, you have people living there, you have your building manager who's basically the mayor who knows what's going on there, right? And then you have the association. So really taking some time now uh, to work together uh, to develop a plan on how you're going to work with each other, help each other out. Uh, the same as residents and uh, homes do, we got to work together uh, to develop a plan and help each other out before, during, and after a hurricane strikes. Also highly recommend taking a Red Cross or American Heart Association first aid CPR class. Uh, get trained uh, personally or as a group. Um, our office also has this class here called CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. We're slowly getting back into uh, in-person training programs. They're gonna start up probably in July. But CERT is a, a 20 hour class that takes a group, say of uh, apartment owners or condominium association and trains you how to be responders within your own building, right? Because uh, from when the disaster ends to when uh, emergency assistance is there to help you, you fill that gap. It could be days, right? So CERT teaches you how to do search and rescue, uh, first aid, how to work together as a group to uh, assist other folks. Uh, and basically it gives you skills to fill that gap until professional responders and emergency assistance can come to your area or your building. So um, it's available on our website. As I said, we're probably gonna start up in July. It's a free class. It's a free training class. We generally do it uh, either in our facility here um, in the Frank Costa building, or we can take the training to your, uh, to your condo if you have a, a meeting, big meeting room. It's usually done over three weekends. Uh, the last weekend, we actually take you up to our bunkers up in Diamond Head, and we do a field exercise where you get to exercise your skills. And again, it's a 20-hour class, free training, highly recommend this course, and also taking a Red Cross first aid and CPR class. So last thing is, again, I, uh, also for our, our, our condo owners, apartment owners, and our residents and homes, what are our evacuation options? Again, if you can shelter in place uh, in your own apartment or condominium, that's the best bet. But again, we don't have a lot of shelter space and you have to take all your supplies with you. But if during your process of developing your disaster plan, if it looks like evacuation is your only option, uh, knowing where the refuge areas are, and this is a link to them there, and I'll, it'll come up again in my slides. Uh, knowing where the shelter is closest to where you live is always a good option. Don't automatically go to a hurricane refuge area because depending on the strength and direction of the storm system, we may open all or just a few. But we will broadcast generally going into the hurricane or tropical storm warning phase, what shelters will be available and when they're going to open. So hurricane refuge areas. And if you have to evacuate either to your home or to a shelter, uh, refuge area, of course, uh, you want to have some extra supplies so we're still in the pandemic uh, phase at this point. So having additional sanitizers and masks and things like this are always good to add to your kit. Now, some things you need to do when the storm is approaching. Now, for apartment owners, economy owners, if you have a balcony or outdoor lanai space, bring everything and take clear it out. Take your bring your chairs, bring your potted plants. We don't want additional things becoming projectiles that could blow off your real and eye and, and, and hit someone. So clear your and eye. Um, charge your devices. That includes your, your cell phones, your laptops, your, your iPads, and even the batteries that you use to charge those devices. Make sure everything's charged up max as much as possible. Uh, if you have open parking, try and secure your vehicle someplace away from where it could be flooded or at least provide some type of protection for the vehicle. Uh, board up your windows or you're gonna have to, you have to put some kind of protection on your windows if possible. Even if it's just closing the curtains. Um, tape does not prevent windows from breaking. Uh, so in taping, it's just gonna waste some time. Tape does not, you gotta have some type of either rolled off shutter or some type of window laminate, uh, but do not bother taping. Taping will do nothing to keep the glass from breaking. Uh, if you have any doors leading out to like the Lanai areas exterior, uh, board those up, uh, um, try and secure them as much as possible. Uh, if you're instructed to turn off your utilities, do so. Um, make sure you turn the refrigerator thermostat up to its coldest setting um, when the storm is approaching so we can you know, get the freezer cold, get the refrigerator closed, cold. Uh, monitor local TV and radio for emergency information. Uh, store water, and I have another slide later on talking about this, I can't say this enough. Storing water versus buying. Buying is expensive and everybody rushes out to buy water. 
store water. Be prepared to store water either in clean one gallon containers like sherry containers, juice containers, uh, filling up your bathtub, et cetera. And if your plan is to evacuate, prepare to do so. If your plan is to shelter in place, prepare to do so. But during the storm, of course, stay away from windows, skylights, and glass doors. Uh, close interior doors, close everything up. Uh, again, prepare to take refuge in your shelter in place room that has been pre identified. Uh, know that higher floors of a building are more susceptible to high winds. And as you probably know, um, I have friends in, in, in tall buildings. When it gets windy, you can actually, you're going to feel the building move. And that's, you know, um, that's actually the, the building is designed to have some sway to it because uh, it needs to have a little bit of movement. So be aware of that. Uh, the, high, the eye of the hurricane, it can get calm. And I've seen this in typhoons and hurricanes. I've worked with one of the Red Cross. I mean, you look up and you see blue sky. Um, be aware of that. Don't go outside because the, the back of the eye wall can, will be closely approaching. The winds will change direction and you'll be back into the hurricane again. So be aware of the eye of the hurricane. And again, uh, if you can, if the radio is still working, monitor uh, local radio stations for emergency information. After the storm, again, monitor TV and radio for more information. Um, a radio is going to be our primary means of, of communicating with our residents after a large disaster. We're going to lose cell phone service. Uh, TV is not going to work. But radio, um, AMF and radio, that's going to be your, your key to getting information. Uh, once it's safe to go down outside, um, be aware of down power lines, broken glass. There's going to be a lot of debris on the ground uh, if you need to move around. If you don't have to go out, uh, get on the road, don't. Only if you absolutely have to. Uh, big thing, of course, uh, and I actually should mention this uh, pre-disaster uh, pre, uh, phase, Take pictures of everything and videos. It's so easy to do now to document your possible losses. Uh, get the cell phone out, have the kids do it, but document everything in your home uh, for the process of uh, you know, um, filing insurance claim, et cetera. So pictures and video go a long way. Uh, even if we have uh, um, public assistance available after disaster, we're gonna need some type of, of documentation of damage and loss to your home or your business. So pictures, pictures, pictures. And once you get the pictures taken, as quickly as possible, start cleaning up because you want to avoid any mold damage if you got water incursion into your apartment or your home. Okay. Um, any questions John, on what I, yes, we, there you go. We do have a question. Yes. Uh, and the question is, how do you maintain the integrity of drinking water when you use your own containers? Clorox and in what proportions? Ah, okay, we'll, we'll get to that actually. Uh, I have a slide that goes into our, uh, our water storage. Very good question. Anything else, Don? Nope, that's it for now. Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about preparedness right now. And um, it's the same thing for everybody, whether you live in an apartment building or a condominium, we're talking the same thing here. So the basics have not changed since I started in this back in the 80s. You want to have a plan, you want to build a 14 day supply kit. You want to have the ability to be informed, right? So first off is you want to make a plan. And I mentioned this earlier, we need to understand what hazards can affect us. So again, uh, we know hurricanes, tsunamis, and floods are going to impact us, right? What does that mean to you in an apartment building? Um, you have power for your elevators, or will you have to walk up and down? These are all things you need to, to look at as you develop your disaster plan. What can impact me? What kind of hazards can affect me? Uh, plan for your family. You want to make sure your family is prepared at home. A lot of us, like myself in the city, first responders, maybe even some of you, have to go to work when the blue skies go gray. So if we have to do that, we're going to be better prepared at home uh, if our family is prepared, because we're not going to be worrying about them. Because if you're worrying about your family at home and you have to be away from them or you're separated, it's going to make things a lot worse. So make sure your family is prepared uh, for you not being in the picture if, if something happens or you have to go to work, right? And again, another plug for hurricane refuge areas. Um, when you go to this link, it'll show you all the shelters, uh, space um, sites that are available right now. Uh, you'll notice also though, that here on the North shore area, we don't have enough public buildings used for shelters at this point. So if you live in this area here, or even along the Leeward Coast here, uh, if your plan identifies that you will have to shelter a refuge area, um, be prepared if you live here, 
to add additional time to your evacuation if you have to go. So again, if at all possible, shelter in place uh, in your home or apartment or that of a friend or family member, but these are the hurricane refuge available sites that are available right now. Um, I, a, couple, a couple of resources I, I, I plug highly all the time, of course. Uh, this is Dennis. Dennis uh, spoke to you folks previously. The Homeowner's Handbook for Natural Hazards. Uh, it's a very good guide. It's available online. It's an extremely good resource. I used the information in this guide to harden my home two years ago when I decided to put in money and invest in window systems, um, shutters, uh, plastic uh, uh, panels, and uh, other systems to protect my home. So again, I can't say this is an outstanding guide. It's updated. It's in its fourth uh, version right now. I uh, highly suggest downloading this now, uh, printing out a copy, or just having it available and reviewing it all the time. There's some really good tips in here. We have just a uh, quick yes. comment. Sure. Um, and it's uh, to remind people to do a proper inventory before the storm. Oh, yes. yes so yes. damage assessment shows items before destruction for uh, insurance adjudication. Yeah. And again, either written documentation, but more importantly, we have so much stuff uh, right now. Uh, video and photograph along with written documentation pre-storm is, is uh, really, 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 really important, especially for insurance. Now, um, this, this site here, um, this book was put together by the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs Insurance Division uh, after the 2018 flood. We found that a lot of folks that came in for assistance to our, our service centers were renters. And uh, quite a few of them thought that the homeowner, the person that owned their rental property would cover their contents. It doesn't happen that way. So if you are a renter in an apartment or condominium, I highly suggest getting renter's insurance to cover your loss because it's not covered by the owner. So get this guide, homeowners, and it's called, uh, my insurance doesn't cover what. It's a very good guide. It's free. It's online. An extremely good resource. And I highly thank BCCA for putting this together because a lot of people either don't have insurance or don't have coverage for everything they need covered, especially for hurricanes, right? So get this guide. We have a, another question about water. Sure. If you live in a two-story double wall apartment building and the bathtub is on the second floor, is it safe to fill up that bathtub with water? Uh, okay, well, um, let's get into the water thing real quick. Fill up everything. Fill up everything with water, whether it's your bathtub, um, empty containers. Um, and if, you know, um, I keep for myself, I keep, I have a, a 50 gallon um, Rubbermaid um, garbage can, a clean one. And I also use that for additional water storage too. So I'll put a <clears throat> put, put plastic liner in there. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. I'll put a plastic liner in there and use that. So even if you have containers that, that aren't clean, you can still use that water for like flushing the toilet or, or hand washing, et cetera. But fill up, you know, fill up the bathtubs, fill up all your containers. I have a two-story house, I fill up both bathtubs. One more question about uh, Dennis's book. Uh, yes. Is the book available to purchase or obtain a hard copy somewhere other than borrowing it from the library? Uh, well, uh, well uh, here's, a, here's a good, Dennis is actually at Kahala Mall right now. And I, I'm pretty sure he has uh, a bunch of these copies available for uh, with him. Uh, in general, um, it is a large book, and, and generally they, they'd like you to either download or view it online. But Dennis will be at home all today until 2 p.m. and more than likely he has a copy of this book. And I think his contact information is in there also. Okay, I'm told that you can also pick up a copy at the uh, main library. Oh, okay, good, good. And I, I believe I believe they have them at City Mill from time to time too, along with the Wine Lecture Company book. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so let's talk about building a kit. Uh, the, uh, the caveat here, well, the goal here is to have enough supplies for 14 days. And that's food, water, clothing, and other essentials. Uh, back in the day, we used to have a list that said, you need this much spam, you need this much rice, you need this much flour. Now, everybody's um, tastes and food types are different. Um, so bottom line is have enough supplies to get you through <clears throat> 14 days on your own. It's a lot to ask. Uh, it is. And I know, you know, some people have a hard time trying to figure out what's going to go on the dinner plate the next night. So do this little by little. You don't want to be rushing out. 
when the tropical storm or hurricane is coming to buy 14 days worth of supplies. Um, important thing is to, as with your personal belongings, inventory what you have in your home right now. And that's your extra food, uh, your ability to store water, and these things here, because we have a lot of stuff in our houses. So inventory what you have, put that next to your list for 14 days, and then see what you need to focus on. Of course, food should be behind the list. Now, things like um, uh, radios, um, they can be expensive if you have to go and buy them new, but I'm, radios and flashlights, I'm, I'm, I'm a thrift shopper. I'm always at Savers, Salvation Army, I'm always at the swap meet. Whenever I find a good deal on a, on a battery operated radio or flashlight, if it's good condition, I'll, I'll buy it, clean it up, put fresh batteries in it and give it to a friend. And so there, there are ways that you can do this on a budget, but the bottom line is having good inventory of your supplies, what you have now, what you need, and build it little by little going into hurricane season or adding to your supplies. And then every year go through the list and update because our foods can expire and things like that too, right? But have a good list and work towards 14 days. Now, be prepared to store water. Um, the Board of Water Supply has an excellent list of um, series of videos at the link here on the QR code, right? That walks you through the process of storing water, how to do it safely. Uh, basically, uh, cleaning out a gallon container, putting one drop of, of unscented bleach per gallon of water, and then you can store it through hurricane season in a cool, dark place. Uh, I am a big fan of this thing, it's called a water bomb. They're on Amazon or other places. I think you can buy them locally at like City Mill, some of the bigger uh, hardware stores. What this does, is it lines your bathtub and gives you a portable, drinkable water supply versus just having water you can use to dishwashing or flushing, right? Uh, it's a one-time use liner. Uh, it comes with this little pump here to get the water up, but it's excellent. I keep four of these in the house, two for use and two for backup. Highly recommend getting one of these water bobs. Uh, you can also buy you know, five gallon containers like these that are uh, food grade designed for water storage, but again, be prepared to store your own water because it's a lot easier than going and buying it. You know, and if you have a multi-story uh, apartment building or a multi-story home and you got to carry that water up you bought, get ready to store water. So, you know, I'm always telling my wife, we keep every gallon container we got, clean them out and get them ready. Uh, and I keep us a supply of unscented bleach on hand to purify and store. We have a question about meals. Is one sure. meal a day sufficient to survive? Um, it, it really depends. I mean, I, I forgot the exact calorie count. Um, you know, when we're in a post-disaster situation, right, we have a lot of things going on. The biggest one is stress. It really is. Uh, whether it's, you know, your home is damaged, you're separated from your, your loved ones, you don't know where your family is, or you're working to clean up a severely damaged home or apartment building, you have stress. Um, if you don't eat properly, uh, you don't keep up your nutrition levels. Uh, if you don't support it with things like vitamins, et cetera, and if you don't hydrate enough, um, you're, you're just going to compound your, your situation, uh, make you weaker, make you able to you know, take care of your needs afterwards. So um, try and plan your meals to stay as close to normal as possible. Now, of course, we're talking about things that are, you know, canned foods, ready to eat foods, uh, things you don't have to heat to cook up. Uh, for myself, you know, I'm a spam a sardine guy. Uh, we keep a lot of extra rice and things on hands like that. Um, a lot of folks are tasted different. We have folks who are like are, are vegan now, so you have to plan for that. Uh, I keep on hand uh, these little cassette stoves. You can get them from like Long's. These little butane canisters. Uh, butane stoves with ventilation, you can use them indoors. Not your Coleman camping stove where you use a white gas. Those things you cannot, you don't want to use a barbecue indoors, but uh, have the ability to heat up water and food if you have to. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have natural gas in your home or apartment, you're in a good place because our, our natural gas system is pretty robust. So more than likely after a hurricane, you're going to be able to uh, start your stove. Now, you might have to use it with a, uh, a lighter because if there's no electricity, your little piezo lighter on your stove is not going to work. But uh, having some ability to uh, warm your meals is good. But uh, if at all possible, try and maintain a normal diet with foods you're familiar with. We have uh, two water questions. Sure. Sure. Um, one is, uh, what about water storage cubes to store water? And the other is a question regarding the use of scented bleach. Okay, so um, whatever, I, I love the cubes. Um, there's a store actually up in, uh, up in Milanani side that sells them because they lock together 
Um, I, I like square containers for my storage, like the square jugs, because square uses up space more efficiently than round uh, if you have to store it. But again, uh, whatever means, whether you, whether you buy cubes, which are great, you know, get them online, uh, whether you go and uh, uh, use your whatever gallon jug you have, have the ability to store water in whatever means you can and store also potable water. Uh, now, uh, bleach, again, unscented bleach. You don't want to use scented bleach because it, it's, you want to go on scented bleach as much as possible or absolutely possible. And you don't need a whole lot. Again, it's like one drop per gallon of water. So now if your plan is to store you know, 50 gallons of water, it's 50 drops. It's not a lot of bleach. So get the unscented bleach. And it's, it's very inexpensive. You don't need a gallon jug of this, like a little 16 ounce bottle, you're fine for hurricane season. Um, now, once you open up bleach, if you start using it, bleach does start to degrade. So if you open the bleach bottle up, specifically you had for water storage, you want to replace it at the end of hurricane season when you can. All right. So again, uh, be prepared for two weeks because you could be isolated with your own home. Our stores and businesses are going to be closed. And more than likely, our shelves are going to be empty. There's a, another question about bleach. Um, yeah. It said that uh, EPA says eight drops of bleach per gallon. Uh, that's a lot. I, I'm, I'm going with, um, I defer to our, our local online water experts, uh, the board of water supply, and, and it should be one drop per gallon. Um, that's what we're going to go with. Eight's a, eight is a lot. Eight is a lot. Okay. So um, what do the disaster supply kits look like? So... You can purchase every hurricane season here. We have a, a number of these kits that pop up that are ready to go. These are good grab and go kits uh, if you have to leave immediately because of like a tsunami or something. But I like to use like wheeled uh, things like these ice chests here uh, to store supplies in case you have to relocate. Um, some folks use like, uh, you can buy like the large wheeled garbage cans to put your supplies in. Uh, if you have pets, remember you have to plan for their care too. Uh, so you have to have their supplies. I have uh, three cats and a dog in the house. So I have to keep emergency food for them on hand along with supplies to take care of their needs. So these are all things you need to have, um, whether they're in an a ice chest or whether they're in a box, but you have to have some way to store supplies. Now, apartments and condominiums, I know we're, we're short in space. Some options are storing supplies under a bed space. I have nothing under there already. Uh, it can be a challenge in a small apartment, especially like a studio to store supplies. Uh, but again, thinking about this now, you got to hear the curve have some place to store your supplies and a place to keep them. Uh, can't stress this enough. We want to have redundant methods of receiving emergency information, right? Um, all of us have our cell phones and smart devices now, and in, in, inherent in those devices is what we call the wireless emergency alerts. Whenever we go into like a warning level event, like a flash flood warning, hurricane warning, et cetera, if you're in an area that's under that warning, you will get alert over your cell phone. Um, most of the phones come with this activated. If it's not, you can activate it within your own phone itself. Um, it, each phone is different. Uh, you can look it up online, but again, make sure your phone is, is capable of receiving wireless emergency alerts. We have our outdoor siren warning system. And that's our sirens on poles. That's to alert and warn folks at parks or beaches, primarily for tsunamis. We have the emergency alert system, which broadcasts information over TV and radio. Now, of course, we have a lot of emergency alert apps that are available to us now, all kinds of them, Red Cross, FEMA. We have an app within the city also for getting emergency information. We have a question about, uh, do you have any suggestions for purchasing prepared emergency food? Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of prepackaged things you can get. Uh, I, I, I usually tell folks, think about it as the camping trip you hope you never have to take. There are prepackaged foods again. Most folks think immediately about the um, humanitarian daily rations or MREs, that's the military package meals, right? They are available, they're not cheap. They run anywhere from 12 to $15 for one meal. Um, the good thing with those is there's so many calories in them, they're designed to support a soldier for like a full day. So you can plan like one of those a day if you have to go prepackaged. Um, you can purchase them online from places like Amazon. There are different types of camping meals that you can purchase. Now, those meals require water. Okay, come to you as freeze dried, so you have to have water. So again, if you have, if you have a freeze dried meal, kind of having water. Uh, there's things you can get um, at the grocery store, like prepackaged cups of Simon, ramen, those things. Be aware that they are high in levels of sodium, right? So you know, uh, if you have specific dietary needs, make sure you think about that. 
when you're planning for what type of meal you want to keep. But again, you can pack, you can buy things that, uh, like camping meals or MREs to support your, your meal planning for that 14 days. Um, monitor local radio. Uh, again, basic AM radio is how we're going to be talking to everyone after a disaster strikes, because that's going to work. Um, KSSK radio, AM and FM. Um, very good choice to tune into, primarily because at their station and at the broadcast tower, they maintain a large generator. So they're going to keep operating before, during, after a hurricane strikes. So KSSK, AM and FM. I uh, highly suggest purchasing a NOAA all-weather radio, weather band radio. You'll get your emergency alerts on here as well as your Wii alerts too. You can get these at like Walmart has them, uh, Target has them also, Longs too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is one of my favorite tips and it's easy to do. Off-island contact, off-island contact. Uh, for myself, my family, and some of my friends, our off-island contact is my Auntie Bernie. She lives in San Bernardino, California. If we're separated due to some type of disaster or, or other event, the telephones go down, the cell phone's not working. As soon as I can get to a working phone line, if I can't call home, I'll call Auntie Bernie and check in there. Because more than likely, our, our off-island um, phone lines are going to be fine. Make the call, make the text off island if you can, check in. And, hey, I'm downtown, I'm okay. So within a few days, you're going to know or be able to know where everyone is, what the condition is, or where, if they're not checking in, they're not, you know, there's a, there's a problem, right? Uh, I'll tell you that in 30 years of working this, this, this job, this, this job, this type of work, the thing that impacts people the most after a disaster is not knowing where your family is. It's, it's the worst feeling in the world. So simple little thing like this, an off-island contact agreement will make a big difference in, in lowering your stress level and helping to get your family back together after disaster strikes. Okay, so I mentioned we have an app within the city. This is it, hnl.info. You can download it. It's a free app to download either on the App Store or on Google Play. You can go online, just type in hnl.info into your browser, click enter. We'll take you to the sign-up page. Uh, we use this for normal information, uh, disaster education. We also do a lot of our, our alert information on here. So we post to this uh, app, Board of Water Supply, from the Police Department, Rail, and also Ocean Safety. So again, it's a free app. You can download directly to your phone. Highly suggest you get it uh, to receive routine and emergency information. Uh, these are additional resources. Again, while we are in the blue sky period right now, nothing's happening. Um, so now's the time to do your research and start your disaster planning process. Uh, we have our resource website here at uh, DM. We have our state counterpart. Uh, we're still in COVID right now. Right now, If you need uh, pandemic information, oneoahu.org is the best resource for Oahu right now. Uh, the other uh, caveat I want to put in there is we are looking at hopefully a quiet hurricane season. Uh, we've had, we had a quiet one last year too. We don't want to let our, guy, our, our, our guard down and become complacent. It's very easy to do. Uh, we need to get into the mindset where you treat every hurricane season as though we're the worst one ever. So you'll be prepared for the worst one ever. Uh, so get ahead of the planning game, plan and prepare now, talk to your family, look at the resources that are available to you and, and prepare for any event. So whatever, whatever preparedness you put to go for a hurricane could work for any type of event, whether it's a tsunami or a flood, et cetera. Bottom line is plan, prepare now for the eventuality of the sooner or later, we're going to get hit by a hurricane, a tsunami, or some other major disaster here. Okay, I am going to stop the slide share now. Okay. There is a question, and sure. it's asking, uh, does uh, it tie in with the 100-year flood possibility? Now, um, <clears throat> the thing to remember with, with, the, with the flood possibility, percentages, right? <clears throat> if your area is impacted with a flood, we say it's a 100-year flood, that doesn't mean you're not going to have known for another 100 years. It just means a 1% chance to think it is over 
the period that you're going to be impacted. So it, it is kind of good. Well, it is good uh, part of the process is understanding if you are in a flood zone. Now you can Google FEMA flood zone maps. They show you the area for Oahu. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the island is not covered by a flood zone mapping, but some is. So a part of your process, you know, planning process, understand if you're in an area that could be impacted by a flood. If you're in an apartment building or condominium that's upper floors, you don't have to worry about a flood so much as the impacts to electricity or access to it from the building. You're pretty good there. But uh, knowing if you're in the flood zone is a good part of your preparedness and planning process. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I, I will I be providing that... uh, you with a copy of the slides after this. I'll send them to you as a PDF doc. Oh, question. If the Alawai floods, will Waikiki be impacted and will tourism be affected? Loss of jobs, question mark. Um, you know, um, floods are floods. Uh, we see this time. The last bad flood we had was uh, in 2021, and we saw what happened in the North Shore. And it was just a rain event. It wasn't even a hurricane or a tsunami. You know, it was just, it was just, a, it was just a severe rain event over the North Shore area, and it took out a major portion of Haleiwa Town. So, any flood anywhere, whether it's the LOI, is going to impact our lives, it's going to impact our businesses, it's going to impact um, a lot of things. Tourism, possibly. You know, not all, not all property is going to be impacted there. Flood waters recede, so it, it may have some, but probably minimal impact to our tourists. But again, you know, if you're in an area near any type of river or stream that's flooded in the past, it's probably going to flood again, so you have to plan and prepare for that. See, next question. Can heavy rains cause dams like in Nu'uanu to break and flood the neighborhood? Um, we have a number of reservoirs and, and one dam on this island right now. And there is a, there is a downstream flood risk. I mean, we saw this in, in 2018 during Hurricane Olivia. A Hurricane Olivia, when it passed through uh, Maui, Molokai, and Lanai, it passes as a tropical storm. So we didn't get, we didn't get the wind damage. But we got so much rain on Oahu, we almost lost reservoir number one, which is in Nuwanu, and that would have resulted in a major evacuation downstream all the way to Ivy Lake. And that's a lot, that's a lot of people, right? So one, if you're downstream of any type of reservoir or dam here on Oahu, you need to plan prepare for that. Now, uh, if you go up to our website, uh, we do have a link um, on there that will take you to, let's see what Hold on. Stand by. While you're looking for that map, uh, yeah. there's a question about, is there a map which shows where the reservoirs and the dam is located? Yes, there is. Um, okay, one second. Okay. Oh, my internet is slow, stand by. Okay, let me share screen again. Okay. Uh, you seen the, are you seeing the website there, Don? Uh, yeah. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is the Oahu Dam Evacuation Planning Tools. It's, a little, it's taking a little while to load here right now on my browser here. Um, you can go Oahu Dam Evacuation Planning Tool. Now, every reservoir and dam owner on any island uh, is responsible for one, developing an emergency plan, and two, making it available for public review. So these are all the reservoirs and dams on the island of Oahu. We have right now 11 that have emergency plans for them. So I highly recommend if you're living downhill at any of these, these uh, facilities, being aware of what the evacuation plan is and the evacuation zones are for them. Uh, and so this just came up uh, last year. It's a very good planning tool. Uh, this, along with the FEMA flood hazard maps, are are good to review as part of your planning preparedness process. If you're not downhill of any of these um, uh, dams or reservoirs, you're good to go. But again, all dams, all reservoirs in the state that could be hazardous have a plan and they're posted on this website. And it's through the Department of Land and Natural Resources. All right, let me turn that off. Okay. Next question is, are our hospitals safe during hurricanes? Our, our hospitals are very robust. They have emergency plans in place to take care of the patients that are in there when patients are being transported. Uh, 
one thing you don't want to do, and in the past, we've had people automatically evacuating to a hospital facility. Unless you're in an emergency situation, uh, you're hurt or injured, you can't just go to a, a hospital. You can't just go and check into a hospital. Uh, your doctor has, has to recommend you going there or you have to be in an emergency situation. So, but yeah, our, our hospitals are pretty good condition, especially the major ones like Queens, uh, Polymomy, Stroud Clinic, the big ones. Um, they plan and prepare for different types of disasters that can impact them and they are robust. Our post-hurricane debris management plan, one of the things that it addresses is uh, clearing pathways along the shoreline routes, going in them, but also going to our hospitals. So we wanna make sure that we can get folks in and out of hospitals as quickly as possible. Yeah, they are, they are very safe here. They plan for this all the time. Um, just a quick uh, comment here. Somebody was asking if there was a hurricane preparedness event going on at Kahala Mall today. And yeah. I think you referred to, yeah. but uh, another uh, viewer mentioned that, uh, yes, there is an emergency preparedness fair going on until 2 p.m. today. Yeah. And it's a, there, I think there are, there's 15 participants in the fair that are out there, including Dennis, uh, along with C. Grant and his books, um, American Red Cross and other organizations. Uh, coming up on July 30th, uh, our department, the Board of Water Supply and the Wailua Community Association are partnering together for a very large disaster preparedness event, Saturday, July 30th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the North Shore. Uh, it's gonna be open for anyone. Uh, we're gonna have, we have right now about 23 or 24 participants National Weather Service, our office, Board of Water Supply, Police Department, et cetera, are gonna be there to talk about preparedness. Uh, we're also uh, doubling it up with a craft fair to, to build our participant base to get more people there. But again, that's Saturday, July 30th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Wailua Community Center uh, Association Gymnasium on North Shore. Next question is, are large, are large residential care facilities required to have emergency procedures in place. On the mainland, many in care homes died. Now, I, I know that uh, care home operators, like uh, small care home operators, uh, I forget what the nomenclature for them is, they're, desired, they're required to have a disaster plan by the Department of Health that also addresses what they're gonna do for a hurricane and for tsunami events, particularly, right? Uh, and part of the plan is, is relocation of their patients outside the hazard area if they're in a hazard zone to another safe location that is not a hospital. So um, if you're not sure, highly suggest asking if, if your grandparents, your mom or dad is in a care home care facility, ask what their disaster plan is. They should have one in place. And if not, ask why. Uh, next question is, I live in a high rise condo in a flood zone. Will I be able to safely shelter place? Um, you know, again, um, the floods, um, um, our damage is the structure is limited, but I'm going to be to the lower floors, but probably like, probably up to the first floor. It just depends where you live, or where you are with what flood zone you are, right? Uh, if you're not sure, I would first off ask the building management. Now, again, with a flood, um, if you're an upper floor, you should be fine. You should be fine. You may have access issues because if the, if the ground floor, the basement of a building gets flooded either by storm surge or flood waters, you're probably going to lose access to your elevators either due to power being out or because of debris um, in, in, the, in the ground floor, et cetera. So you have to plan for that. But upper floors, you should be fine. You should be fine. But again, uh, check your flood zone. If you're not sure, talk to your building management and, and see what the effects of a flood could have on your building or condo. I'm just giving it a couple seconds just to see if uh, we have any more questions. Um, Oh, are commercial high rises required to provide evacuation sites during an emergency? Now that that's pro, I'm assuming that's part of their fire evacuation plan. Uh, I can't speak to fire evacuation plan, but more than likely is I would check with your building owner or management on that. Okay. Looks like uh We've got our questions answered. Okay. So, uh, John, I want to thank you for uh, an excellent presentation. Um, before we leave, though, uh, what I would like to ask is uh, we have a poll that we'd like all uh, the participants here to uh, take. And the, uh, it's a short poll, which will only take you a few seconds. And this will help us uh, 
evaluate uh, this presentation and also will help us in the future uh, when we do uh, you know, future presentations. So please take a few seconds. Uh, it should be, should have popped up on your screen and it's only a few questions long. Okay, I see people are still uh, filling it in. That's good. Okay. Um, looks like we've got uh, some decent responses. So we want to thank you uh, for joining us today. And also, again, we'd like to thank our speaker, John Cummings. And this concludes our presentation. We hope that you all have a wonderful weekend. Aloha and mahalo.